This is Peter Salzman, the first person who has been able to break the laws of physics. Because he has managed to glide with a wingsuit, but upwards against gravity. And this is me, talking to him right after he landed from that flight. But if you look closely, he wasn't flying with just a wingsuit, he had a wing under his body. Why are parachutes numbered in this sport? Why from now on has building, antenna, span, earth jumping unlocked new impossible cliffs? And most importantly, why could I myself have given this brilliant idea to the Red Bull engineers years ago? Is that what you're about to find out? Seven years ago, I had an experience that completely changed me. On the edge of a cliff, I experienced the strongest wind of my life. Guys. Bye. That inspired me to start a big project, to design a suit that might allow me to fly in those same conditions. The problem is, I'm not crazy enough to jump off the cliff. The idea was simply to stand up, so obviously it didn't work. But that experience sparked a huge curiosity in me about the wingsuit. A sport in which jumpers feel the aerodynamic forces in their own bodies, forces that are normally only studied in a wind tunnel. Guys, guys, guys. A few weeks ago, Red Bull contacted me with a wild idea that only they could dream up. They wanted to optimize the aerodynamics to such an extent that a wingsuit athlete could stay in the air forever, something that no one has achieved until now. And to do that, they would alter the traditional concept of these suits. But to really understand it, you first have to see how the aerodynamics of a simple wingsuit work. You see, if a jumper glides with, with this angle, we'll have three forces, and these three are what make the magic happen. Wild stunts like these rely entirely on the combination of these three forces. And watch out, because this applies to any object that glides. A plane with broken engines, a bird, or even a paper airplane. We'll use a diagram of a wingsuit jumper for this explanation since that's today's topic, but it applies to any aircraft. First of all, we have the force of weight. This always points toward the ground, no matter the angle at which the jumper falls. Secondly, we have the force of friction with the air, also known as drag. The important thing about this force is that it always goes in the opposite direction to the jumper's movement. But the key to everything comes with the lift force, since it is perpendicular to the drag. It's as if these two were connected. I'll give you two examples so you can understand. In the first example, a person falls at this angle. As mentioned, weight always acts downward. Then we add the friction force, which goes in the opposite direction of the movement, and perpendicular to that we have the lift force. Here's another example of a jumper falling at a different angle to highlight the difference. As we said, the weight always goes downward. Then, the resistance opposes the movement and the lift, which is perpendicular to the movement. As you can see, as the jumper leans more, the lift points more and more forward. And this is what makes him move forward as he descends. For the jumper to descend at a constant speed, the sum of the upward forces must be equal to his weight. In this case, we have the vertical components of the lift force and friction. This would be an ideal case. Reality is a bit more complex because the speed is rarely constant in a real jump. Normally, it varies along with the changes in the jumper's attitude. But let me show you what happens when a jump is made from a mountain. In the first instant when the jumper is already in the air, we have the weight pointing downward. But since he just jumped, the speed is very low, so there is practically no lift or drag. The jumper will fall straight down, gaining more and more speed until the lift is big enough. And there you can clearly see how the suit starts to fly and the jumper begins to move horizontally. It takes about 5 seconds to reach that speed after jumping. That's when the suit is already flying. If you turn the nose upward, lift will increase and therefore you'll fall more slowly. The issue is this will also raise drag. As I was saying, all of this applies to any object that glides. Alright, we already understand the basics of the wingsuit, but for this challenge of flying forever, this alone wasn't enough. Since around 2021, Peter thought about adding a wing under his body to improve his flying capabilities. In this case, the theory is the same, but a bit more complex since now there are two surfaces generating lift and drag. 
If we're talking about a standard wingsuit, the glide ratio is about two, which means that for every meter you go down, you move forward two meters. To put it in context, a commercial airplane has a glide ratio of about 17. So actually, a glide ratio of two for a wingsuit is very low. But if you add a wing underneath the wingsuit, you can increase the glide ratio up to five more than double. This shows the magic of aerodynamics. A well-chosen surface weighing only about five kilograms and positioned in the right place can make you fly twice the distance. Because normally, on a plane, wingsuit jumps from a plane, mountain slopes, whatever it is, and you turn for the first 30 minutes, and then you have to open your parachute and walk. In fact, you always go down. And the idea of this is, or the innovation is, to stay longer, maybe. You might think that just by adding any wing, the capabilities improve, but not with the design of this wing. It's taken months or years, doing aerodynamic analysis by computer, then tests in wind tunnels, and then trying it out with real jumps until reaching the final design. Like, as Peter says, even with the wing already selected, its position relative to his body or the set angle of attack completely changes the behavior. Another interesting point is the winglets. The surfaces at the ends of the wing, they serve to reduce aerodynamic drag. But he told me that if they are too big, they could cause a stability problem during turns. This happens because the winglet starts to generate a lift force to the side, which makes turning more difficult. So they came up with a solution of using medium-sized winglets. With this system of the wingsuit and the wing, they've managed to unlock new jumps from cliffs that weren't possible with a normal wingsuit. Now that they can fly it more, they can actually do them. As they gradually saw the improvement in flight, they started to wonder if the unthinkable was possible to fly forever. You'll see. To generate lift, the wingsuit glides, meaning it uses its altitude to gradually descend and takes advantage of that speed to create lift. If you use the suit along with the wing, you descend at a vertical speed of about 20 km per hour. On the other hand, the forward speed is about 100 km per hour. And of course, when he saw these numbers, Peter realized that maybe there was a place in the world where the wind could blow upward at 20 to kers per hour. It would be possible to fly straight without losing altitude, essentially flying forever. Red Bull Advanced Technologies heard his idea and started researching possible locations that met those conditions of 20 km per hour of upward wind. Yes, that place existed. At this point, they contacted me, called me, told me the whole idea, and asked me to join them. Of course, I couldn't resist. Well, we've come to El Hierro Island in the Canary Islands, where there's a lot of wind because that's exactly what we need. This island, El Hierro, has a gigantic cliff that's a kilometer high. In that location, the wind usually blows this way. And since there's such a high cliff where so much air mass hits, it has to accelerate a lot and take an upward direction so that all the air mass can get through. It's exactly the same concept as when you put your finger and close the opening. One in the wind would rise at kilometers per hour. It's crazy, this is outrageous. The plan. The 
plan was as follows. Peter would take off flying in tandem with David Tejero, a professional paramotor pilot. Peter would be seated on a sort of platform and would be towed up. At the same time, there would be two skydivers flying along the slope, measuring the air conditions in real time to give the signal so that the jump would happen at the optimal moment. In addition, there would be rescue personnel stationed on land and in the water, just in case there was an incident. On top of all this, when Peter jumps, he would be followed by a drone piloted by Ivan Marino, a professional first-person view drone pilot. This way, we could get a shot following Peter with the hillside in the background and see how he was flying without losing altitude. Peter would jump from the paramotor and head toward the right side of the cliff, gradually starting to turn left to fly parallel to the edge of the cliff. Receiving all the air head on, this is the area where he could feel the rising air. He would travel about 800 meters and then turn around to make the trip in reverse. And the idea was that if the altitude had been maintained, he could reach this point and turn around again to come back. And he would go out again. The explanation looks great on paper, but we all knew it wouldn't work the first time. Peter wanted to gradually feel more comfortable each time. In these first attempts, you'll see something clearly. Even in perfect turns, you lose significant altitude. That's why on the straight part, it was necessary to gain altitude in order to stay flying in the circuit. So that what was lost in the turn could be regained on the straight. Another very important point is that the suit with the wing is an unstable system. Airplanes have a tail at the back with the sole purpose of being stable, but here there's no tail so Peter would have to be moving all the time to be able to fly straight. Like when you balance a broom on your finger, you have to make constant corrections. You always have to balance, accept the force and be adapt to the conditions actively. You must always be fully active. Something I had overlooked is the piece that connects Peter to the wing. Uh, it's really putting a lot of force on his hip. And even though there's a sheet of foam, it presses on him hard. From what he told me, more than half of the lift comes from the wing, and that gets transferred to his body through that small piece. I have to think that the wing is creating lift and there is a force. And that force passes through the wing. And it enters my body here. And I have a setup that puts everything on a more... But... I still feel a force if... If you look, there are pieces of wool tied to the wing's top. This is because after each jump, small adjustments were made to the angle and position of the wing, depending on how it had behaved. Basically, they knew that from Peter's sensations, but they also checked the behavior of the wool in the videos. After many tries, ideal conditions finally arrived. Experience a historic event in top quality. challenge marks a before and after in this sport. Not just for what's been achieved, but because the goal is to keep improving this concept until the unthinkable is accomplished. And the final goal for the future will be that we no longer need a parachute. Can we stay in the air or even travel with that system? Wow, yes. You heard right. The idea is to be able to jump and land without needing a parachute. I'm not sure how they plan to achieve it, and they've said they can't share details yet, but they're already working on it. 